don't want this getting out. So. Hello, everybody. Give me a second to set up here. I got one minute. Hang on. Stand by, everybody. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Mr. Crow. How are you? Not too bad. Randy, how are you doing? Yeah, fine. Thanks. Awesome beard, bra. Nice. Thank you. Very nice. Finally made it to one. It's the sixth <laughs> one. I finally made it to one of them. <laughs> Great. Uh, so give me a sec. Let me uh, no problem. Get, get back in gear here and figure out what I'm doing. Stand. I'm probably going to take my camera off in a couple minutes. So. Oh, okay. Just because. Yeah. <laughs> Supraposito, your choice, your choice, your yeah. choice, absolutely. Uh, what the hell am I doing here? X split cam, standby. I also screwed up the last time and uh, I didn't start the recording, so I got to make sure that uh, I got to make sure that I don't mess that up this time. Hang on, standby, standby, standby. <laughs> nice. Hi, uh, happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween. <laughs> yeah. Happy oh, wait, my, my, my closet door is open. How embarrassing. Stand by. <laughs> oh, I'm, in the, I'm in the bedroom. I don't have anywhere else to go in this house. I mean, <laughs> in the work at home situation, I have a gaming room, but the work at home situation has taken me out of the gaming room. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Let's see how the, how the fake green screen artificial intelligence does with this. Uh, it looks pretty good. Garth, party on. Party on, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think I'll just remove that. Uh, yeah, stand, stand by. Um, if, if you're a scientific type, there's a, a YouTube channel called Periodic Elements. Periodic Elements. It's the periodic table of the elements. And one at a time, a sort of mad professor, Sir Professor Martin Polyakov, uh, who has hair somewhat like this. Uh, oh, uh, let me let some people in, hang on. Uh, um, uh, does a presentation on uh, all the elements one at a time and he has a whole staff and they do experiments and stuff. It's called the periodic, what's it called? Periodic videos, periodic videos is what it's called. And if, you, if, you, if you're interested in science, you should definitely check out that channel. It's just an absolutely awesome channel. Uh, so as you guys know, I'm, I'm kind of new to Zoom here. So I'm still trying to figure, figure out, I just see a big giant Sarah. I think it's because she was probably the last one who spoke. So that yeah, oh, yeah. my screen probably jumps. And now it's you. Yeah. Now okay. it's you. Yeah. Now it's probably right. me because I'm talking. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Did you work for Sega, Sarah? No. Or is that a costume? I made the shirt myself. It's Halloween. Happy Halloween. Oh, I don't want happy this shirt Halloween. To, I sorry. don't want this shirt to leak because I want to, there's a person who I want to surprise with it. And I don't know if this person is watching the videos or not. Do you yet. want me to wait to post this? No, no, no. That's a, no. It's, it's going to be years before I. Oh, okay. It's, it's, the person's in Canada, the border's closed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. okay. So it's, you know, okay. it's, it's going to be a while. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm just going to stop the video when you say recording. Yeah. I, I mean, well, I think shirt. it's already started. Uh, no offense. I, I, I'm still trying to. That's uh, okay. It's okay. I don't it think does show recording up in the corner there on the screen. Oh, it does. Yeah. Oh, I see Wait, it. Yeah, turn the camera th on. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I better thanks. be turning my camera uh, on. Uh, Mr. Crow, what is your first name? You're Jason, is that right? James. James. Sorry, sorry, yeah. James. James. No problem. Sorry, James. Yeah, pl a pleasure to finally meet you. Is that your dog? What kind of dog is that? Uh, I have two. That one is the Great Pyrenees that likes to bark all the time. Oh, wow. That's a big one. Yeah, it's great Pyrenees. yeah she's got a bit of lavender, so she's a little bit smaller than a, a, a standard, but uh, still a good uh, barker that scares a lot of people, so. Yeah, I have two Airedale Terriers, and they they love to bark. There's no question about that. They they love it. Uh, okay, so um, Robert, hey, uh, are you there somewhere? Yeah, I'm right. Hey, hi, how are you, man? Can you hear me good? Oh yeah, perfectly, perfectly, perfectly well. Um, so I think you talked about you had a polo or something that you were working on. Is that right? Oh, I'm working on the polo Hanorex, and I actually went by your flow chart. Uh huh. And uh, I did observe the ticking sound. Okay. And so what I've done is I, I went ahead this week and uh, ordered some hots from uh, Mauser. And I just pulled the old one out. 
So I'm, I'm sort of disappointed that you did that in a way because, uh, it, and it's fine really, because you're going to have to do it anyway. But, but I wanted to show you a real quick shortcut for testing the horizontal output transistor. Did you finally figure out how to test it and you're assured that it's bad, which I am assuming it is? Um, you know, I was going to do that this week, but I got caught up in uh, repairing my million dollar man pinball. Ah, do and you I, have a, do you have a digital multimeter? Yes, it's right here. Uh, do you have the uh, the uh, horizontal output transistor that you removed handy? Right in front of me. Okay, so awesome. Is there any possible way you can point your camera at the meter so we can all see or or uh, can you not? Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Yeah, turn uh, it on. Yeah, she, perfect. Oh, you have a nice fluke. Okay, she, great. She, she got, but the thing is, uh, the camera's actually on my computer. Yeah, no, that's fine. No, put it back on the desk. That's fine. And, and uh, turn it on and let's see if we can just uh, eliminate the glare. So put it on diode test setting. And face the display toward us a bit. And there, yeah, we can absolutely see it. That's fine. Um, oh, not fine now when you move out of the way. Uh, try, uh, there, it's okay. perfect. Do you, do you see? Yeah, that's perfect. If you can keep your body, uh, keep the, the thing in the shadow of the lamp. So perfect. So, so as most of us know that are watching right now, this is a really simple repair. Um, and it's a very common failure, super easy to diagnose. And in general, especially in a monitor that has a switched mode power supply. Uh, it does no harm, doesn't even blow a fuse, and you just find the bad transistor and you stick a new one in and, and it all works and it's groovy. So um, the, di the diode test setting, uh, with the meter set on the diode test setting, put one meter lead, it doesn't matter which one, on the center leg of the horizontal output transistor and one meter lead, which is the collector, it's called the collector, one meter lead on the right-hand leg, which is called the emitter, and you should not have continuity there. You don't, and you don't. Touch your two leads to each other. Let's make sure your meter's good. Yeah. Oh, I doubt that this is bad then. I seriously doubt that this is bad and your ticking is caused by probably something else. So a quick question about orientation of that. Um, oh, you, you say left and right on the, is the base of the point. emitter. Good point, James. Is it the points down or, or up, I guess? Okay, good point, James. Good point. So you're looking at the transistor face up, meaning you can see the, the part numbers printed on the transistor. Is that correct? Yes, that side up. Right, right, right. So with that side up, the three legs from left to right are in alphabetical order. The lead on the left, I guess I could go to the board, but I won't. Uh, the lead on the left is called the base, B-A-S-E. The lead in the middle is known as the collector of the transistor and the lead on the right is called the emitter. So, you know what, let me do go to the board. St stand by one sec. Let me just uh, hopefully not drop everybody out here and uh, change camera. Stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by. Uh, this guy, this one, yes, okay. Give me a sec here. <clears throat> so you can see it, great. So um, <clears throat> the uh, horizontal output transistor is what we're talking about here. So horizontal output transistor, uh, sometimes referred to as the H O T or the hot. I personally don't like calling it the hot. I'm perfectly okay with H O T, but I don't know. Calling it the hot is kind of weird. You can if you want, but uh, it's horizontal output transistor. Anyway, the horizontal output transistor is always an NPN transistor. As you know, there are two different transistor polarities. One type is known as NPN and the other type is known as PNP. And it has to do, as you probably know, with the type of silicon, silicon uh, from, from which the transistors are made. They're manufactured from, trend, from silicon that has either more or less electrons in it, and it gives it a positive or negative charge, and we're, that's not the point of this discussion. So an NPN transistor, uh, the schematic symbol looks like this. Um, and this, this is what we're talking about now. Sometime in the future, we'll do a transistor discussion and we'll discuss PNP, but that's not what we're talking about right now. 
So um, a transistor is really just a switch. And as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> one lead is known as the collector. I'm gonna just do this really fast here. Collector, C-O-L-L-E-C-T-O-R, sorry. Uh, another lead is known as the emitter. And one is referred to as the base, which has nothing to do with its physicality. It's not like the bottom of it or, or anything like that. I don't know why it's called the base. It's just called the base. I don't know why. It's just the name of one of the three legs. And as I mentioned, it is the, they're in alphabetical order. And they will be the same in all of these big power transistors. It's not the same for every transistor in the world. But on, on any of these big power transistors, uh, the lead on the left is the base, the lead on the center is the collector, the lead on the right is the emitter. And as you probably know, if it happens to have a metal tab, if the tab on the top is made of metal, that tab is electrically connected to the collector. It's the same thing. The way they're manufactured just real quickly is that they start out with a single piece of metal that looks like that. Just a piece of, I don't know what the metal is. And then they bond a little chip of silicon to it. That's the size of the actual little transistor. It's a little chip. And then um, they run, um, and so that's the same, that's the, the electrical connection to the collector there. And then uh, there's a lead on the left and a lead on the right, and that's the base, and that's the emitter. And there are little gold wires that run down from the die, as it's called, the D-I-E, the die like dice, but you know, one of them die uh, down to these down to these legs. And then the whole thing is covered with this epoxy plastic. So the center, like, it's really important to realize, not in the case of the transistor you just showed me because it has a plastic tab, but if it has a metal tab, the center leg and the metal tab are connected together. Hence, you have that insulator behind it. Anyway, so the way, you're, the way a transistor works and the way you're testing it is that um, when it is turned off, sorry, let me back, back up for just a second. The main switchy part in a transistor is between the collector and the emitter. Mm -hmm. When it's off, there's no connection. And when it, the transistor is turned on, there is a connection between the collector and emitter. And it just occurred to me, there might be people in the waiting room, which I don't, I'm not quite familiar with how Zoom does this. I thought I told it to go ahead and let anybody in. Uh... Okay, I don't see anybody in the waiting room. Okay, great, sorry. Um, uh, so when it's off, there's no connection between the collector and emitter. And when it's turned on, the collector and emitter connect together. I mean, nothing moves. It's done with atoms and electrons and stuff like that. But, but, that, but that's what it is. When it's off, there's no connection. When it's on, the collector and emitter, the center leg and the right leg are connected together. Uh, what turns it on? Well, that's what the base does. The base is the control of a transistor. All we have to do is put a little bit of juice on the base and it turns on and it doesn't take very much. In this application where the emitter happens to be grounded, it only takes seven tenths of a volt to turn on a transistor. So that's like nothing. That, that, that comes from a transformer, which we don't care about. And it's not the point of the discussion today. All we care about is your transistor, which apparently is good. Um, so when this transistor fails, what it always does, always in my experience, tell me if you've seen anything else, is that the collector and emitter short together, like a hard dead short, which you can pick up with your meter. So with your meter set on either diode test or even the low ohm scale, when you <coughs> do the test that you just did between collector and emitter, your meter, the fluke, should read OL, meaning overload, meaning it's an infinite resistance there, really is what it means. Other meters, for those of you at home that have a cheaper meter, their meter will read uh, the, a number one with no digits after it. So that is what's known as your open reading, which is how a good transistor should test. When the transistor is actually bad, it shorts. It just dead shorts between collector and emitter. Uh, you can actually see it under a microscope. When you take a cover off of a shorted transistor, you can look at it and you can see that it's, it's dead short. Uh, um, 
And you could pick that up with your meter. So what you did, the test you just did was you put one of your meter leads, it doesn't matter which one, on the collector. You put one on the emitter and it should read open, either the one with nothing after it or like on the fluke, like I said, like you showed us, OL. So that typically means that that transistor is really perfectly good. Now there is a whole transistor test that we can go through, but I'm not sure that we want to do that at this point so you have some other weird and mysterious problem i think could i have tested this in circuit oh 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 great question great question so uh, let me just uh, let me change cameras here stand by because that's kind of what I, when i said gee i wish you had left it in circuit uh stand by one sec stand by stand by stand by oh, i should be able to do this quicker sorry it was good solder practice no, yeah, well, there's no more important skill than soldering practice, than soldering. There is just absolutely no more important skill than soldering. It is absolutely the most important skill you can have. And so that's good. I, I'd I mean, argue really desoldering is a, definitely another one that you want to have. Oh, I guess, oh, I guess I include, you're right. You're right, James. I, I co sort of include that all in soldering. And I, you know what? I can't stand this anymore. <laughs> Sorry, that's better. Uh, uh, I was wondering when you get tired of it. Yeah, boy, that's pretty itchy. I don't know how anybody. Hey, John, uh, Paul, how are you? <laughs> good. How are you doing? Fine. Hey, you shaved today. Nice. Thank you. You look good for Halloween. Uh, 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 where was I? Now, it's now, Paul, you messed me up. Where was I? Where was I in this discussion? Oh, yeah. So, um, so in circuit, uh, James or whoever's, who is asking this? Robert. Uh, sorry, Robert. Uh, in circuit, Robert, here's the deal. The emitter of that transistor is always grounded in any monitor, always, always, always. The horizontal output transistor emitter, the right-hand leg, is always connected to ground, which in this monitor is like the chassis, the whole metal chassis and all that stuff is ground. And remember the center leg of the three legs is the collector. So all you really have to do to test this in circuit, and it just takes a second, is put your meter on the diode test, just as I indicated to you. Put one meter lead, it doesn't matter which one, on the metal chassis and touch the other meter lead to the center leg of the transistor. Power off, of course. Yeah. And if it beeps at you and shows you zeros, it's, it's dead short. And that's almost always your problem. I'd say it's always your problem. Uh, on the other hand, in your case, it's open. So that's kind of what I expect. And if you have ticking on a polo, you have some other issue and, and let's troubleshoot that. You have not replaced anything, correct? No capacitors at all? No, no, I actually was able to order a flyback because I figured it might be that. And I got one for 25 bucks. Whoa. And if, well, it's uh, Shop Arcade, I think it's called. They said it was for a polo. It's got the same amount of pins. Well. John or Paul, do you have any feedback in this regard? Um, since the hot is the H O T is good, <laughs> um, I would uh, I would probe uh, the the three holes he left open and see if there's any shorts on those holes. Precisely so. Uh, what I what, my question was actually about the flyback. I knew I was just wondering if either of you, John or Paul or Sarah or anybody, are familiar with that particular flyback that he just held up to us. Um, I haven't been, I haven't, uh, needed to replace one yet. So I'm okay. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, you know, it's, I just think it's kind of, in a way, it's sort of weird how many flybacks you guys replace, uh, you guys, you game collector guys, uh, replace, you replace a lot of flybacks. And I think you just kind of do it automatically and, uh, you know, does it hurt? No, it doesn't hurt. It's just like 20 or 30 or 40 bucks extra that you probably didn't need to spend is, is my only point there, really. Is there not also an argument to the, the, the newer flybacks aren't as good a quality as the older flybacks? So if you, if you are replacing them, sometimes you're taking out something that's solid and you're putting something in there that could fail a little bit sooner? I don't absolutely. have personal experience, but I would say absolutely as well, because it comes from China. 
So, you know, it's just cheap crap that they knock off. They somehow get an original. They can take the potting off it. There's solutions that dissolve the potting that's on a flyback. And then they look at how it's made and or simply measure the inductance and the resistance of the thing and just come as close as they possibly can and sell it to us. And, and so absolutely, I think that there's a real good chance. But I, I you know, Paul, do you know, do you have, does someone have empirical evidence of this or not? I've replaced hundreds of flybacks and I never replace a flyback if it's working fine. If it's holding its focus, it's holding its screen voltage and it looks good, I leave it alone. The only time I replace them is if they blow up or they're losing their uh, uh, those uh, two uh, things. I I couldn't agree more. And uh, you know, I think maybe what some people have a problem with is that they're scared to have a flyback blow up on them. They're scared that if they don't replace the flyback, at one point they're going to do a bunch of work on it, plug it up, and it's going to blow up in smoke and flames, which it might. Uh, uh, but they, you shouldn't be paranoid about that. For goodness sake, you, you, it's just electronics. Nobody's dying here. It's just electronics. And it's kind of fun to see a flyback smoke and fry, really, in a way, if you're not too panicked by it. You know, I mean, the only thing that's going to happen is the flyback itself is going to catch fire and the horizontal output transistor is really likely to blow. And if you're, you know, if you're paying eight bucks or something for it, that's, that is a waste of money for sure. So, so does, does that make sense? How do you test the horizontal output transistor uh, so far? Yep. Everybody okay on that? So, so now uh, Robert, what we need to do is determine do we have a power supply problem, which is where the ticking is coming from, and it's caused by typically overcurrent protection kicking in? Typically, the tick is caused from the power supply trying to come up in voltage. It sees a dead short and quickly shuts itself down. And then once a second, it tries to fire itself back up again and, and looks around and says, how you doing? Are, are you guys okay? And then it goes, oh, crap, you're shorted. And shuts itself off again. And then once a second, it waits for a second and then says, well, how you doing now, baby? Oh, no, you're short a damn. So every time it comes up and goes down, it makes that ticking sound. And the ticking sound is typically emanating from the yellow transformer that's in the switched mode power supply that's in the monitor. Uh, in some cases, you may actually hear the flyback ticking as well. If the horizontal output a transistor is shorted, it runs current through the power supply and through the fly, see, from your perspective, from the power supply, through the flyback transformer, through the shorted transistor to ground. And so both of those coils will receive current and they'll both kind of make a little ticking sound. Um, so our next step, uh, if, if we're ready for some more advanced kind of stuff, Robert, are you with me? Are you with me so far? Other than that, I don't know where the power supply is you're talking about. I mean, I have right. thing in front of me, so I'm trying to go. Yeah, know, I don't I don't uh, expect that you do know. I don't expect that you do know. Right. Um, uh, but what we're trying to determine is whether the power supply in the monitor is bad or the the or it's something loading down the power supply and it's actually perfectly good. So as I think it was Paul that suggested this, and it's an exactly correct suggestion. Leaving your meter on the diode test setting, put one meter lead, it doesn't matter which one, on the metal chassis and touch the other meter lead to the center leg where the collector of the horizontal output transistor used to be. The center pad, that is, the solder pad where the transistor used to live. And let's see if we see a short circuit there. Let's just see what you got. It doesn't matter which lead. No, nope, doesn't matter because we're just looking for a short. It really doesn't matter at all. So, you know, from the bottom of, you're on the bottom of the board. The board is flipped over. Yeah. The solder side is up. Okay, and so just, here we go. Uh, it says, oh, well. Yeah, also no short. Okay, let's just double check your meter one more time. Touch your two leads to each other. Okay, this is uh, maybe an important thing to just mention to you folks every now and then when you're technicianing. When you keep seeing an open reading, 
you you got to kind of ask yourself, did my meter lead break somehow? And every now and then it does. So if you just touch your leads together, you go, oh, meter's working. Okay, the leads are good anyway. Okay, so that's very interesting. So the next thing we want to do might be a kind of interesting and difficult thing to do that you and I and we might want to wait till next week to try. But we can try this. Is it possible for you to reassemble the monitor without the horizontal output transistor in there and plug it in sometime during this meeting in the next hour and a half? Mm, I'm not really seeing that happening. The, the, okay. The RT right. over there. Okay. And on the bottom of this thing, they have a, I think it's called a film cap. Is that normal to be attached to the bottom of the board? What is that square what thing? Talking about? What is that? Right here. Yeah. What What did you call that? It It looks like what. Well, from the one I saw, the the fellows did the the polo on uh, YouTube. They, they call these film capacitors. They're They're the same as the ones right here in the in the on the top. Oh, really? Oh, that's I've never seen one tacked on the bottom of the board like that. Yeah, I thought that was kind of strange because again, in that video, that film cap actually turned out to be the thing that was the problem. Yeah, it's a polystyrene film capacitor or polypropylene film capacitor. Oh, wow, how interesting. You don't find those going bad very often in the normal run of lifetime of a monitor, but you guys are running these monitors for 40 years now. So you are seeing failures that we just don't normally see in a normal lifetime. So absolutely, because those are part of the... Um, uh, either high voltage filtering or retrace tuning, depending on where they are. And uh, those definitely could, could cause lots of problems if they failed. And, we, and if they failed, they would short. That's the only way they would fail is to short. So very interesting. Well, here's the deal. Okay, so listen to me carefully, Robert. So here's the end to everybody, I suppose. Here's the issue. They have a monitor here that is ticking. Ticking means that the switch mode power supply has gone into over current protection or OCP mode. And yet when we just measured the main current path of the of where the current, the main place where the current flows out of the power supply, not every place, we don't see a short circuit. So the next thing we want to ask ourselves, is the power supply messed up? In other words, do we just have a bad cap in the power supply, which is entirely possible? It's way possible, since you haven't replaced any capacitors, that in the power supply, you have a bad capacitor somewhere that's kind of tricking it into thinking you have an overcurrent problem, but you don't really. Uh, uh, you do not have a capacitor meter of any sort, an ESR tester by any chance? One second, one second. One second. Yeah. There might be one on his fluke. Not ESR, it might be microfarads. It wouldn't be ESR though. I don't think I don't think any fluke has an ESR. Oh, I don't know. Maybe some of the brand new ones do. It'd be foolish Good not question. to have one. Well, well, yeah. he's going to get his uh, yeah. his meter there. Yeah. When when we do cap kits on these, are we better to shotgun the caps, or or do you like that idea of searching for which cap is the one causing a problem? So that's a great question, James. Uh, I'm sort of a technical instructor, right? So that, so you have to bear that in mind, my answer is this, but I'm also a really curious person and I'm also a really lazy, 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 lazy person. Hang on, hang on, Robert. We're gonna get back to your problem in just a second. Um, so what I often wanna look for is what I refer to as the magic bullet. That is to say, you might have 20 caps that are on their way out and really deserve replacing, and that's fine to replace them. But there's one that caused your symptom, probably, because it was working yesterday. Today, it's not working. There's one cap that went beyond the pale, I guess. It, it, just, went, it just went beyond whatever limits it has. Um, so the, f the fun of finding that is the detective work. And as a technician... Uh, that's what I like. It's really interesting and fun work to be able to speculate what the problem is, put your meter on one part, and sure enough, your diagnosis was correct, and you replace that one or two parts, and it's working. And to me, that's the most sense of pride as a professional technician that I get. On the other hand, if you just want to fix the damn thing, and you don't really care how it works or anything – you can shotgun, shotgun all of them. To shotgun them means just to pull them all out and stick them all back in. 
But the caveat there is that if you goof somewhere, you don't know where you goofed. So I think that if, even if you're going to shotgun all of them eventually, I would change two or three at a time. Reinstall the chassis, fire it up. Uh, same symptom or not, right? Oh, it's fixed. Now I know it's one of them three or same symptom. At least I did goof it up. Phew. Let's move on. Turn it off. Pull the chassis. And I swear to God, you do not have to discharge the CRT every time. You really don't. Even if the CRT is charged, you can work on the chassis. You can touch anything. The high voltage won't get you. I swear to you. So all it is is a matter of turn the chassis over, change a couple of caps, put the chassis back, fire it up. Oh, same problem. Turn it off. Put the chassis back up. Solder. You will not get a shock. I swear to you, you won't get a shock from the high voltage anyway. Mm. Uh, so anyway, so that's what I do. So, so I do a few at a time for two reasons. Number one, I am looking for the magic bullet. I really want to know which one cap I can replace and have it work. And the other thing is, if I do goof up, I want to know that it's something that I just did in those last six solder joints. And then I can go back with a magnifying glass and see what I did, if that makes any sense to everybody. Uh, okay, so, so that's the same approach as with E and pinballs. You don't adjust everything. You just oh. do a couple, yeah. see what goes on, and go back. Well, I mean, you do. The first thing you do is raise the play field, tighten all the switch stacks. Yeah. Physically that's look at it, obviously, you know. And if but but you don't, you're not burnishing contacts or bending anything at that point. Yeah, you're, you're just making sure all the switch stacks are all tight, you know, because that's a big one. That's a big one. You know, is the motor run out switch good? Is it all, you know, some of you don't know about EM pinball. That's cool that you do, Robert. That's neat. That's, neat. That's crazy. Well, this is what I got for a Okay. Meeting. Oh, you got that one. Okay. So I've owned that one and it sort of works. Okay. okay. So um, I don't recall that that one works so well in circuit. I think you might have to pull, uh, pull that, pull the cap out of circuit. I'm really not. Paul, I think, didn't you buy a, every single one out there and try that one that he's holding up? Uh, I haven't tried that one. You haven't tried that one. Okay. Uh, anyway, so um, in the power supply, uh, uh, Robert, on the power supply section, which you will see, right, just find where the AC input power cord comes in and that corner of the board is, is power supply. There's a bunch of capacitors there. Uh, have you ever used that ESR meter? Do you know how it works? Um, I've, I've tried to use it and I got, I actually bought a cap kit for this because I am going to put a cap kit in it eventually but I, I like what you're saying let's find out which one was bad and that's kind of the whole uh purpose of going through this so this is the ac right coming in yeah sure is yeah and underneath that cage just take the cage off there the there's cage. power supply under there it's funny that's the only monitor that's caged like that it's psycho and that's actually a it's actually an emi cage you don't have to put the cage back on when you're done with it that's to satisfy fcc part 15 requirements or something like that part 95 i can't remember so so you can't even peer into it at the moment because it's covered with that thing so with that case so so go ahead and you know after this at your convenience after this meeting pull that top off start checking those those capacitors my next step really would be to install what is known as a dummy load and let me go to the board and just mention this as long as we're talking about this is everybody else in this meeting okay if i if i continue on this vein sort of everybody okay on sure. this awesome okay i just want to talk for a minute about something called a dummy load and uh what am i trying to do here i'm trying to change this stand by stand by, stand by. Ooh, do, do, do. There we go. Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to zoom in. I'd make it easier for you if I just zoomed in on the board and you don't see me, just, just see the board, I think. That'll be okay, I think. All right. So, you know, again, I, I, I don't have any hardware here. It would be kind of neat if I had the hardware and perhaps as I'm discussing this, uh, Paul, if you want to pull something up, if it's easy for you, do it. If you don't, that's fine too. I got plenty of hardware here. What would you like? 
Well, uh, I, I want. Do you know what I mean by the dummy load using an incandescent using an incandescent lamp as a dummy load? Absolutely, I got mine sitting right here. Oh, okay. You know? Well, pull out your dummy load and get ready to hook it up to the the center leg of where the horizontal output transistor used to be. Okay. Somehow. Uh, you know, I mean, if you have a chassis with the transistor still in, we can pretend it's not a problem. Just just show us that somehow. And I'm not sure how to turn it on to you, the camera. I think you're just going to have to talk, and it'll it'll switch over to you. But let me let me mansplain the uh, you know what I'm talking about here. So here's the deal. Let me think. How I'm going to do this. So um, in the monitor, you have some sort of a power supply. And of course, the purpose of the power supply is to take the alternating current input and give us some kind of direct current output. That's the purpose of a power supply. At the same time, it changes the voltage for us. Here in America, we have 120 volts AC, 120 volts AC, and elsewhere in the world, as you probably know, it's 220 or 240 volts AC in. And then depending on the kind of monitor, we have a bunch of DC outputs. I honestly didn't look at the Polo. I don't care. I didn't look at the Polo schematic to see what the power supply output is, but it might be 125 volts DC or something like that. Just, just for the sake of discussion, let's call it that. There are other outputs as well, and we're not really talking about those. There, there might be a 12 volt output. There might be a 6.3 volt output. There's a bunch of different outputs. That's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about the main power supply output, which is often referred to as the B plus, the main high current power supply that that the power supply uh, that the monitor uses is sometimes referred to as the B plus for reasons that there are historic reasons for that. You don't care about them. So let's just say it's 125 volts, the B plus. So the B plus goes to a lot of places, but the main place it goes, the main current draw, the thingy, the circuit in the monitor that's drawing the most current from the power supply is a circuit known as the horizontal output. Horizontal output circuit, which is obviously where that horizontal output transistor lives that we've been talking about here. And the way it works, if, if you care, I guess you do in this case, is that this 125 volts or whatever it is, it could be 60, it could be 90, it could be 100, it doesn't matter. This 125 volts, um, the current flows out of the power supply in this direction and goes into the primary winding of the flyback transformer. It's called the flyback transformer uh, because it's powered by the horizontal circuit. And the way the horizontal circuit works is that it makes the beam move from left to right, and then the beam quickly flies back to the left-hand side. So it's called the flyback transformer. And then it's connected to our buddy, the horizontal output transistor. So this is our old friend, the HOT, the horizontal output transistor. And it's always an NPN transistor. The arrow you can see is pointing out that makes it an NPN transistor. The emitter is always grounded to the yeah. chassis. Always, always, always. And it's driven by some circuitry that you don't care about. Uh, it's sort of complex, but pretty interesting, actually, kind of circuitry that one of these days maybe we'll get into. Right? So normally your issue, Robert, is that, or what we thought it was, was, gee, this is going tick, 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 tick. And normally it's because the horizontal output transistor is shorted. It's drawing too much current through the primary winding of the flyback transformer to ground. And it causes this thing to enter over current protection or OCP as it's called. And that's what makes the ticking sound as I described earlier, right? But in your case, it ain't like that. 
In your case, we measured the horizontal output transistor from the center leg, which is the collector, to the right-hand leg, which is the emitter. And it says open on your meter. It's open. And I'm trusting you're doing it correctly. You seem pretty intelligent. So, so it's open. And remember, what we could have done in circuit is put one meter lead, doesn't matter which one, on the actual metal chassis, because that's ground, and touch the other meter lead, whichever one, it doesn't matter, uh, to the collector, the center leg of the transistor with the meter set on diode test setting or lowest ohm setting. And if it was shorted, it would be bad, but we don't have that. So now we've removed this transistor completely. And, and what we want to do now is determine if the problem is in the power supply or not. So logically, you might say to yourself, well, since the load, the transistor here is removed, there's no load on it. Can't we fire this thing up and just kind of see what's going on there? But a power supply may or may not work properly without a load. This is a really important thing to know. Some power supply designs, if you don't have any load on them, the load, L-O-A-D, load, being the thing that's taking the current from the power supply, some power supplies, they work perfectly okay without a load. But on, for example, the earlier monitors that had the linear power supply with the, the STR3123 voltage regulator in them, there's a resistor across there. With a, a shunt, it's called a shunt resistor. Without a load, the voltage goes up to 160 volts, even if the regulator's perfectly okay. So again, my point is that power supplies don't work properly, typically, without a load. You cannot call it good unless you load the thing. So all I do to load uh, uh, a power supply is I get just an incandescent light bulb. The wattage kind of doesn't really matter. I, you know, I typically get 100 watts, but you can't get those anymore. You could certainly get a 60 watt, and it's not LED. That's real important. It has to be an incandescent lamp, you know, with a you know, little filament inside, uh, because we're going to make what's known as a resistive load. So, uh, 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 Paul, can you show us the uh, can you show us the dummy load that you made there? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I did it a little different. Uh, let's let me show you here. I got a instead of taking the HOT out. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can flip this around. Is everybody seeing Paul okay? No answer. I will, uh... Yep, go over okay. here. All right, good. good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you. Here's the hot right there. back here i didn't uh uh disconnect it what i do is i totally isolate the power supply can you guys see that right yes. here yes there's yes. usually a jumper or a coil right here oh and you can isolate that and uh that would work uh just fine so we're gonna flip this around uh, so i could uh show everybody can we see the, the actual a, load? Flip, flip, flip it around. I don't understand what your your question is. I'm sorry. My video. Can I flip the video around? I don't know what you mean, like mirror image? Uh, so uh, my front, ca do I have a front camera, so I guess not. I should have uh, set up my camera. But anyway, I set Are up. Are you using uh, like a cell phone? No, I'm using my uh, uh, Chromebook. Oh, oh, I see what you're oh okay. Yeah, I don't know if you that's, cumbersome. that's cumbersome. Yeah. There, and I got the video ground here. See video ground here. Then when I, uh, this is a good working power supply. I flip it on, and I got my uh, incandescent light up there and out of the way, so it lights up. So that means I have a good power supply okay so so all you but, have uh, done is gotten a construction socket and hooked it up to a couple of wires with clip leads on the end or something uh yep i just uh, okay. uh did that there's always a uh the, 
chassis I mostly work on, uh, this is an easy test, easy, quick test. It takes just a minute to isolate the power supply and uh, just hook up a ground and uh, you could test the power supply. You could also, uh, what I also do is um, with the B, B plus pot, B plus pot, I'll adjust the B plus pot to see if the the uh, the light gets brighter and dimmer and I'll monitor the B plus to see if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. If it's not too high or not too low. And uh, that's the way I do it. Okay, so all of that is good. The only, uh, the only, it's not an exception at all. The only uh, other thing I would say is for many beginning technicians, figuring out how to isolate the power supply from the circuit there isn't that easy. In other words, what, what Paul has just said is, gee whiz, sometimes there's a coil or something in between the power supply and the load. And gee whiz, we can just pull that sucker right out, hook the lamp up to here. There's the lamp connected to the chassis and, and Bob's your uncle. So if you can do that and you can figure that out, that's great. But I think that, that Paul, that that might be a little bit beyond what some people have as a skill set. So I would posit this other kind of way to do it. And that is sure. this, that the primary winding of the flyback transformer is pretty darn rugged. You really can't hurt that. I mean, if you put a, a DC source across it for a long time, you might be able to burn it out, but probably not. So what I would say is that when the, when the transistor is out, we now have three pads. We have a center pad, solder pad like that, that is that goes to the collector. We have a right-hand pad that goes to ground like that. And then here's the base, the base pad. And what I mean by pad is the thing that you solder to, right? So the transistor is taken out already. And what I do if I, I find some other component that's hooked up to this trace, if I can find some other part and from the top of the, the board, just clip onto it. Or sometimes I will just solder a little piece of wire on there, just solder a little wire tag onto the center leg and connect one, of the, one, one side of the dummy load to that. And then the other side gets connected to the actual metal chassis. And then I do precisely what Paul said. You know, you're looking at it. And actually what, what happens uh, pretty quickly is you get used to the brightness level. You can look at that brightness level and you go, that's correct. Or you look at it and go, oh no, that's a little lower. <laughs> oh, wow, that's too high. It's pretty obvious when you see it as a brightness level eventually. Um, so Randy, anyway, I'd like to also mm -hmm. add, you could, uh, I do all this testing on my bench. If uh, you got the power supply isolated or you got the HOT pulled out, there's not going to be any high voltage. There's going to be some lower voltage you got to watch, but oh. there's not going to be any high voltage uh, coming out. Yes, val val valid point. Without the horizontal output transistor in there, you never have to worry about EHT. But as a reminder, you do have in some monitors other power supplies that will disappear. In other words, in our older monitors, like the K7000, the, there are what we call flyback derived power supplies, there are windings on the flyback that make just not only just the high voltage, but they make 24 volts that powers the vertical output chip. It makes 12 volts that powers a bunch of other stuff. And it even makes the heater voltage that makes the glow in the neck of the picture too. So when you remove the horizontal output transistor, you kill all, all that stuff. So like, don't freak out looking for your 12 volts because it ain't going to be there without that horizontal output transistor in there. But that, but, but you don't care about that because that's not what we're looking, right? So um, you know what, I'll post that. Let me make a note, flyback derived power supplies. Let me just, I'll, I'll post that on the, on the Facebook thing. Hang on. All right. So Robert, uh, is that enough uh, info for you to munch on for a while? Yeah, that's enough info for me to be <laughs> um, You know, another observation I made, I took my 5X and I looked at the actual solder joints on the flyback, and there was more than one that's cracked out. It's got the, the circle, you know. So uh, I'm going to try to reflow those too. Uh, that is an excellent, excellent, excellent point. Uh, and, and I just want to remind everybody that uh, – this is super common. Fractured, fractured solder joints 
are super common. And the more massive the thing is, the more likely that is to happen. Remember how we play games, right? We're pounding on them, vibrating them, joysticks back and forth. All that vibration translates to anything that's massive and, it, and eventually it just cracks. Additionally, you have another consideration where you guys are collectors. Most of you turn your games off, I'm guessing. And if they're in the basement and it's really cold, when you <clears throat> turn the games on, they get warm. Then you turn them off and they get cold. It's called temp cycling, temperature cycling. And um, the component lead and the, the lead tin solder alloy have different co coefficients of expansion. That is to say they contract, expand and contract at different rates. And so that's what causes those cracks as well. So, uh, so absolutely, you're totally correct, Robert. That's a very, that's a very good point. Very, 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 very good point. Okay, so, uh, well, we've got plenty of time. We've got another hour and something. Uh, so, Randy, yeah, you have a, I found on the internet, you, you actually made a flow chart for Tolo, correct? Yes, I okay. did. So I was kind of looking at that and uh, the way I found out about it was the, the fellow on YouTube, I think he's from John's Arcade, I want to say. Uh, oh. he, he was actually using it to fix his uh, Hanatrex Polo and was driving him nuts. And he finally, he got with your thing and he went through everything. And, he, and, and the part that with the ticking and it goes over, he said he had changed out all the capacitors, but he, he failed to look at the, the ones that you had called out uh, oh. on your flow chart. And that's uh, when he changed the uh, film capacitor out and he said that that was it. Oh, that wouldn't have been on the flow chart for sure. That's well, that's good for him. It's, you know, a... It'd be nice if these people gave us a little feedback and posted their fixes on somewhere. I'm not sure how you guys do it other than is KLOV still a thing or is it just the Facebook group now? Yeah, there's still a lot of people still on close to video games. Yeah, well, okay. So there's any kind of there's a bunch of little uh, sites too. Okay, I guess you guys have ferreted them all out. I'm guessing. Right. I'm one of those guilty ones that just finds the solutions and then doesn't post that they worked. <laughs> yeah, well, I got to contribute more because it's it's very helpful for me and it's be nice to help others as well, right? Yeah, and it might be that you're thinking, oh, that was so simple. I, I, you know, nobody wants it. Everybody knows that. But uh, for example, not, not to call you out, Robert, at all, but I guess I, I am. Um, I would have thought everybody knew how, how horizontal output transistors work and how to test them, but they don't. So when you say to yourself, ah, that's so simple, no one would be interested in that, you're probably wrong. Mm -hmm. Probably wrong. Probably. Well, you know, you know, I'm just trying to learn all this stuff. And, and yeah. No. Again, I mean, I can fix just about anything, weld up the crack it on, put wheels on a miscarriage, but um, <laughs> that, that's just, you know, because I was a welder in the Navy for many years, and I'm just really fascinated. I'm, I'm right on board with you on the repair technique. Now, I, I would like to play this, but I'm not really interested in, in arcade games playing them. <laughs> Me neither. Why this, thing, why this thing broke, that's what I want to know, and, and you know, uh, what Paul's saying about how to test and what you're saying about how to test, you know, I'm going to find my own path to do what I'm going to do, but, you know, I, I don't, I've never done it before. So I'm learning. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm easily available when you, you know, you can, you can email me, Randy from at gmail.com. My, my cell phone number is six one nine eight three eight seven one one one. I publish it. You know, give me a call if you have a problem. I'm happy to help people. It's, uh, yeah. it's kind of my whole thing. I did buy the flyback, but I figured what we talked about last week was, you know, maybe not available, you know. So I figured, you know, I got one for the, the stockpile. Um, sure. Question I have about, and it's kind of a rookie question, but I need to know this before I ruin something, is static discharge, um, with like uh, new parts and everything. Is there something I can make to where I can know that I'm discharging my static? I mean, I know that probably- Well, they do have static wristbands. They have these carbon impregnated wristbands with a, a wire that you connect to something you know is grounded to the earth, earth ground. Uh, and they were really important at one time in the world of electronics, especially, and, and, and even sometimes now. Uh, um, 
where static was a very big, gigantic issue. So on some things, it, it certainly is. Uh, I'm. Do you are you working on carpeting or something, or why is? No, that I don't have to carpet in my house, but I just you know I, again when I'm observing, you know, watching videos of people fixing stuff, and they, they talk about the static discharge, and how like say you could have brand new chip or some component, and if you discharge your static through it on accident it'll ruin it oh it will uh it will uh, i mean other than touching ground all the time um uh you don't know there's no way that you can determine if you are charged other than trying to discharge yourself and just touching things that are grounded really uh i have a i have an interesting story if you'd like to hear this it'll take me about five minutes to tell my static story anybody want to hear it i know you do you want to hear this? You want to hear this tragic story? How Randy Fromm probably changed the history of the video game business. Yeah, that sounds like a great story. To be honest with you, let's go. Uh, oh <laughs> God, I've never admitted this to anybody, but but the statute of limitations has passed, and I think even some. We want to pause the recording at this point. No, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, but that. But thanks, James. Okay, so here's the story. Every year in London, England, there's a big game show. It's gigantic, a gigantic game show. And in 1976, I guess it was, yeah, uh, it was known as the Amuse the ATE show, Amusement Trades Exhibition, ATE. And it is a fabulous, gigantic show. At the time, it was being held at a place called Earl's Court, which has subsequently been torn down. But it's a huge old venue and it's held in January. So imagine freezing cold London in January. Uh, and that's where this show is, is, is being held. Well, at the time I went to the show and I was living up in the Bay Area, just down the street from Atari. And I knew all the guys that worked at all the, the, the Silicon Valley gaming places and I just was plugged into this this whole group of, of geeks, I guess, you know, engineering geeks and geeks and stuff like that. So so we went we went to this show and uh, the guy says my buddy says to me, Randy, there and, oh and, and I was writing for a magazine at the time. So um, Randy, do you want to see the most amazing video game thing? It uses a microprocessor. Whoa, you know, it was all TTL games up until this point. Randy uses a microprocessor, which I had been reading about a little bit. And I knew something about microprocessors, the Altair 80,008, you know, other weird, you know, weird stuff. Anyway, so I went, boy, howdy. Yeah, show me. Let's go up there. So, again, freezing cold day in London, no humidity, freezing cold. He brings me up to the hotel room where he has this thing all laid out on the dresser, top of the top of the dresser, because he's going to bring investors up to show them this thing. They don't have a booth at the show. A lot of a lot of companies do this. They have a secret show up upstairs. So no, he's gotten it all working. It's all there. It's turned off. It's turned off when I get up there. So he brings me up to the room. He goes, look at it. And I'm looking at the hardware and it's all laid out. It's big. Yeah, a bunch of big boards and kind of kludge together with that hookup wire, the blue hookup wire, a little kludgy looking. Uh, but it's all laid out, but it's not turned on at the moment. And the guy says, excuse me, I got to go to the bathroom. So he turns his back and he walks into the loo, as they call it over there. And I walk toward this thing. Again, very, very cold dry London day and this is a really old hotel with woolen carpet I'm oh, drag no. I, I have leather shoes on I mean a dress suit I drag my feet shuffle my feet across the carpet and I'm saying to him call, calling him to the bathroom hey uh, which one's the microprocessor is it this big chip right here and as I lower my finger to it from this far away an arc jump from my fingertip to the microprocessor chip right to the center of the damn chip like right into it <gasps> oh i freaked out so i just backed away from the thing i just backed away from the thing and when he came out of the bathroom i was five feet away from it 
and he turned it on and it started to do a ram clear, you know, or like, like uh, the Williams games do with all the dots, da, 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 ram clear, frozen. It gets to whatever execution point in the program, freezes solid, won't go any further. It's a prototype. It's the only one of its oh, kind. No. All the development stuff is back in Sunnyvale anyway in California, and I'm in London, and the show is in eight hours. So, so yikes, yeah. So static can be a problem. So I, you know, uh, um, I really goofed up this probably, and 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 so the, you know this could have ended up being a really big video game company, you know, that could have been the new Atari or the new, you know, whatever, and I might have destroyed all their hopes and dreams i and never followed up apparently took down a giant probably. yeah i could have yeah butterfly effect you know? <laughs> that's, so that's say, like, it sounds like a great scene from a movie or something oh god yeah tron 3 right <laughs> 20 years later he's got a shop uh, you know Maybe that video game company would have taken things the wrong way anyways and so that's that right that's right Damn solved them. a lot of issues that made it just at the perfect world that we have now that's right <laughs> they sucked anyway so actually they were great guys I, uh um so um uh, paul or somebody paul was it you that had that weird image where half the screen was black the right half was kind of yes it was very it's on a san Diego 20 yep yep yeah so uh, um did you ever uh, hook up your scope and all that stuff um i actually have it all hooked up i have everything set up um, if you want to let me in on my phone, uh, we'll probably uh, do yeah. a video and uh, show everybody okay. how uh, this yeah. works. Oh yeah, I'll let you in. It shouldn't be a problem with two uh, accounts. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's show okay. everybody the symptom. I don't know what the okay. answer, but let's show everybody the symptom. Neither do I. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just looking for a participant in a waiting room, I guess, and you'll show up. Do, 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 do. You see me? It says, please wait. The meeting host will let you in soon. Randy oh, from CD Workshop. No, pause on core. Oh, no. Maybe I've been screwing people this whole time. I I sure don't see that. I sure. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Admit. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Just took a second. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Cool. I wonder if we'll hear echo audio, audio like two audio streams. We probably will. If you can mute your phone, probably. <laughs> Yeah, it's bad. Mute your phone. One. There we go. Okay, how's that? Yeah, super. <laughs> All right. You'll, you'll still get it because it'll pick up the. Um, uh, oh yeah, it's yeah, gonna pick yeah, up the you're, audio. You're gonna turn down the audio on your computer as well. I've done enough of these Zoom meetings yeah. through work now to know that that's a problem. Hey, you guys see the problem there? Don't don't take the brown acid. That's simply not too good. Wow. So, you know, it doesn't look as ragged as... There we go. It doesn't look as ragged, Paul, as it did when you showed me on the other screen. Yes, it decided uh, to get a little better, but as you can see, it's tearing at the top. Yeah, do me a favor. Reach in the back and adjust the screen pot down. Down. So it's less bright. If you can do it without killing yourself. That actually got a little worse by doing that. You see uh, that? I see the tear, but I don't see the profound darkness it's, effect. It's perfectly black here. And this side is all faded. Hold on. Let me. Uh, can you put it on a solid raster? Yes. I don't care what color. You've got some sink issue there, too, though. No, it's out of sync. You're, what you're seeing is the beam reflecting off the inside of the angled part of the CRT and then bouncing off and hitting the screen. Your whole raster is shifted way off, in this case to the left as I'm looking at it. You get what I'm saying? I get what you're saying, but uh, I'm not it's really sure. It's all out of sync, uh... Paul. It's all out of sync. I could see that there was no, it was not the wrong sync polarity or something. Okay. I, uh, I, I put a new sink pot in and I adjusted uh, center uh, centering horizontal pot, but uh, there's obviously, obviously some other type of failure. Around yeah, no, no, it's yeah, it's not position at all. No, it's strictly either automatic phase control AFC or it's probably really sink. 
I mean, have you, you're really familiar with this stuff. I'm sure you have it hooked up correctly. Was it working previously? And then all of a sudden it started doing this? Nope. This was oh. the customer's complaint. And oh. I haven't uh, resolved it yet. Oh, so okay. So, so this... far I uh, uh, did a full cap kit. I fixed a bunch of cracks in the traces uh, that were uh, 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 pretty uh, nasty. And um, this is where I'm at right now. I, okay. also, I also swapped Sorry. out the 1464 in case of, uh, like you said, the sink issue, but that ship was fine. Um, tell me again what the uh, what model number we're looking at. We're on this is here. Sanyo EZ20. Okay, let me just look at the schematic here. Hang on a second. And if anybody at home wants to look at the schematic, uh, pull it out. Uh, EZ20 schematic. Yeah, bye probably on my website oh come on Randy here we go stand by <laughs> is it an easy V or uh, it's an easy V there's easy V and e easy e Y and easy Z even uh, they all should have the same same circuit though yeah they will yeah they sure will okay so let me look at these coming up, coming up, coming up. Oh God, I hate this. Stand by. Stand by. Up, up, uh, okay, stand by, stand by, stand by. Loading. Did you want to share it on the screen? We could see it. Uh, you'll have to call it up on your own screen. I'm not proficient enough to really figure that out yet. So, if I share my screen, you can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you see that? Oh, I don't know. I'm looking at something else completely. Anybody else see it? I see it. Yeah, yeah I see it. All right, awesome. It's a pretty decent, clean uh, schematic that I found. I don't remember where. It's in my Dropbox of good information. So. Oh, good. Um, so stand by, I'm just looking. Uh, Randy, another yes. symptom, uh, is when it's cold and you fire it up, it's just slightly torn at the top and it progressively gets worse. Okay. And you've changed the chip itself. Yep. Uh, I, I socketed a new chip in there. <laughs> yeah, good idea <laughs> well it's 50 bucks a piece i'm not going to waste a chip oh god is it really no yeah, yeah. is it really yeah um all right well i need to look at a schematic that i can scroll around with so oh stop stop wait a minute hang on go up go up where does the sink come in where does the sink come in here uh, there it is right now. there here's the sink Res sync, there it is. Okay, sync. So, so did you replace that transistor, that sync amp transistor? Uh... No, but I tested it and it tested good. Okay. And the diode associated with the D two eleven. Yep, tested good. Um, scroll down a wee bit, please. Thank you very much. Oh, this one, this is working splendid. Who's who's in control of the schematic? James, is that you? That's you. Great. Uh, um, scroll down a bit more, please. Oh, I like this. It's like having a, it's like having a voice command computer. That's called an emitter follower. An emitter follower comes out. It goes down and to the right and down. And have you changed? Uh, scroll down just a bit more, please. Let's see. Okay, stop. So uh, C162 uh, or 152, do you see it connecting to pin 23 
of the sync amp maybe are you absolutely it's a non-polarized that one right there is that a, that's a non-polarized capacitor did you get an exact replacement and a good one for that yes i got those in stock i uh okay. it's a 4.7 uf right 50 okay. volt uh, cap i got plenty of those and i've uh, replaced them yep i replaced it well damn your eyes then okay um uh, 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 I guess we're certain it's a monitor problem because they brought it into you, didn't they? Yep. Uh, it's definitely not synchronizing. It's it's absolutely not synchronizing. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, I'm just looking. I this is maybe this might be too boring for this workshop. You know, it's just me staring at the schematic, trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, I you know, here's here's my concept. Uh, go go back up to where the uh, where the sink comes in. In the upper left hand corner, computer. Scroll up. So okay, so stop there. So following from pin six, inputs are on the left, outputs are on the right. So pin six, go down, 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 down. Go to the right. Now you go up a little bit, and into the base of that transistor. So that is just a standard NPN transistor, and it's mm -hmm. actually an, it's really more for impedance matching than actual amplification. You have an oscilloscope, correct? Yep. Paul? Yep. So I would certainly like to look. I'd like you to look at those signals. I'd like you to look at what's coming in on the base, and more importantly, what's coming out on the emitter. And let's make sure that's good because you said you tested that transistor, but you know, there's nothing like good old replacement sure, um, to be sure. sure, which we haven't done. So we might look at that and scroll down a bit more, please, because we're now following from the emitter. If you follow from the emitter of that transistor down, goes through that resistor uh, to the right. Yeah. Down to the right. Down, 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 down. Right this is to working the chip. great, super. And it goes right in. So that's how the, the chip itself gets its sync signal. And I've never seen this chip ever fail with, in a, with bad sync. Ever, never, 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 ever, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. And from there, it goes right to the horizontal oscillator and the vertical oscillator and stuff like that. And so I just don't see how it could possibly be anything but the actual sync transistor. I just, I just don't see how it could. And so at this point, we're going to have to start looking at it with an oscilloscope, I think. I think. Okay. Because let me go to the board here and just explain again what I explained verbally, um, but uh, you may not have understood. So stand by one sec here while I go to here and I go to the board. Oops, sorry. Wrong thing. Stand by. Gosh darn it. I hope to get more efficient at this coming up soon. Uh, original. There we go. You're doing well. I've been doing <laughs> Zoom meetings since February, <laughs> oh. and nobody's really got it down yet. So. <laughs> hey, Randy, I got my oscilloscope all set up right next to the chassis. We could uh, do a, a okay. probe it right here. Oh, okay, let me let me do this real quick and then uh, just kind of explain what this is and then and then we'll, we'll go back to it and take a look at the signal. All right. But Paul, you really come up with the doozies, don't you? You're you're my hardcore you know, problem. I, guy. I, I could go through and fix 20 or 30 chassis and I get one that I get stuck on and it takes me it could take me a day or two to fix it just to try and figure out what's going on. It's just the nature of the 40 year old beast. <laughs> um, I'm really lucky when I was sitting on the bench at area amusements in San Marcos, California, fixing games on it for the route. My bosses were very patient and sometimes, you know, fix half hour, you know, 45 minutes out a lot of times, but sometimes I'd be two days on it and it'd be like, I'm going to get you one way or another. And at times, many more than one time, I've taken parts from a good working thing and a bad thing and just done this. Just swap them back and forth. And when the problem moves with the part, it's like, so that's it, huh? You know, I never would have figured it out otherwise. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so here's what I speculate the deal is with, with Paul's uh, deal. Um, it all looks really ragged. 
it lo looks really ragged, like dark over here and, and kind of bright over here on, on this side. So um, the way timing works is that the lines are supposed to start on the left-hand side and they're supposed to be drawn from left to right and, and, and on the right-hand side. To ensure that that happens, we have these synchronization signals that come in. And in this case, we're really talking about horizontal sync. The horizontal sync signal tells the beam to start drawing on the left-hand side, draw a line from left to right, stop at the right-hand side, and then quickly retrace back to the left-hand side. What's happened in your case is that this whole raster, which is normally supposed to be like a square, you know, rectangular raster there, is all shifted over to one side. That's what it looks like to me anyway. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure I'm correct. And here's what's actually happening physically inside the picture tube. That the beam, the beam, let's say, is supposed to be uh, shooting out and, and hitting the, you know, the front of the screen somewhere. Instead, it hits here and bounces off. So what you're getting is a kind of a double whammy. You're getting some of the raster that normally that it's normally painting on the screen, but when it's all when the raster is all the way over to the left hand side, it really thinks it lives here now instead of here. It's really hitting this and bouncing off, and uh, I mean it won't damage it or anything. It just looks like you know crap. So mm -hmm. I think I said, so I, I'm pretty darn sure that we have some sort of a horizontal sync issue where it's just not right. So it's either that or it's in AFC, something known as automatic frequency control. Let's find out now if you have a scope there. Let's, uh, I mean, since you're telling me that the, the sync transistor seems to be okie dokie. All right. Uh, let me see if I can set up my camera to show everybody the, the scope. Okay. Well, what are you seeing that up? Actually, a quick question for you, Randy, as well. Yeah. Um, you, you do a great job when we go through all the um, the components, how the things work, and all that kind of stuff. Have you ever done a, a, a video or anything on convergence and um, and that kind of stuff? No, I haven't because I am not the convergence expert by any means. I personally have had very little good luck with purity and convergence if yeah. it doesn't if it doesn't go perfectly it's not going at all for me um so there's a gentleman know, up here in london ontario i don't know if you probably heard of rick neiman no he was the guy who set up the um the kitchener plant for oh, electro home for electro home oh great yeah and so i did a course with him Ooh, uh, went to fun. his house went to his house oh, a great guy really smart guy and uh I should do this then as long as we're talking about Canada. Yeah. So um, that's where I am. I'm just uh, north of Barrie, Ontario, but an hour from Toronto. So, um, and uh, I went to his house. He did a, he did a, a small group of four or five people. Oh, what fun. And, and he was saying in the plant, they had 30 seconds for purity and convergence. Mm -hmm. Boom. On to the next one. Yeah, and he showed I, us quickly how to do it. And it was amazing how quickly he could do it, but it's such a, like, it's not, it's a talent, not a science. Uh, it is kind of an art form. I, uh, I've been to lots of monitor factories all around the world in Korea and Taiwan and Italy and the United States. And I had really close buddies at Wells Gardner. I was there. I've been there a lot. And it was really interesting to watch the assembly line because each person just did one quick thing. In other words, one guy just did the purity. The next guy just did green on red. The other guy did the blue on the red green pair. One guy did this. One guy did that. And it just went down the line just like that. A horrible job. I'd shoot myself with such a, you know, they're working in the dark, basically, because all the lights at the factory are very dim so they can see the screens and stuff like that. It's like a, it was like a dungeon in there, you know, in a 100 year old factory. It was it was pretty weird. It was pretty weird. Anyway, Randy, can you see my scope? All right. So let me make your picture bigger here. Yeah, sort of. It kind of got a lot of glare on it right there. Uh, hold on. Let me close the garage. Door. Well, this should be interesting, folks. Let's see how this works. Is that any better? Yeah, super. And then I just want you to crank the brightness down 
quite a bit and maybe come come closer in on the screen. The brightness on the scope? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see how it's blooming out? There we go. There, oh, yeah. How's that look? Yeah, mucho mejor. Much better. Okay. So the first thing then show us, uh, just for yucks, the sink coming in from your pattern generator that goes into the base of that transistor. I'm not looking at the schematic at the moment. Just a sink on my pattern generator? Well, let's look at it on the monitor, you know, where it goes into the, doesn't it go into the base of the sync amplifier transistor there? I'm not looking at the schematic now, so I don't know. So what was that, transistor James, were you throwing up the schematic? Was that you doing that? Yep, hold on a sec, I can- Okay, uh, I can yeah, just, just let me, show me where the, the sync comes in there. Computer James, show us the schematic, please. Oh, there's someone in the waiting room. Oh, God. Hey, John, I see you finally. Come on, share the different one here. There you go. Hey, Jeremy, are you with us now? Jeremy? Yes, hello. Oh, hi. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know how long you were waiting there. I just, I'm uh, new to Zoom and didn't see the waiting room had somebody in it. How long were you waiting? Uh, about an hour. Oh, crap. No, that's no, not. You're just lying. You're lying. You're, that's not true. I just I actually forgot that I left the window open. I'm, I hope I'm not hijacking too much, but I saw it. And I thought, look, I got to jump on because here in Australia, our time zones are so out of whack that I never get to participate. Well, it's first thing in the morning for you. So good morning. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So um, so we're looking at pin six. And as you can see that, you know, we talked about this just a second ago, pin six, the sink comes in and goes essentially to the base of whatever transistor number that is. What is that? TR204. So I want to look at the base of TR204 first, um, Paul. And, okay. then, and then I want you to show us the emitter uh, because it's an emitter follower. So then show us the emitter. There's the, can you see that? No. Yeah, I'll have to stop sharing. Oh. Then it'll jump up, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. All right, let me see it. How's that look? I don't see any pulses. You may have to zoom in more on the. Let me uh, adjust You might the... have to turn up the brightness somewhat, depending on how fast the pulses are and stuff. Okay. It'd be really bu much better if you could get closer to the screen. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So that's the input. So it's negative sync? Uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Does that look all right? Yeah. And so the emitter should also have the same then because it doesn't invert. So this should look the same on the emitter. That's uh, on this one, the center leg? Well, I don't know which is the emitter. It's I think he's ECB. It's one one or the other. There you go. That's that the emitter. Like the... Yep. Okay. Sh show me the base and then show me the emitter again, back and forth. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. All right. So that's perfectly okay. Okay. Uh, that is perfectly okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that sync amplifier whatsoever. Oh, the mystery continues. Um. Okay, James, toss up that schematic and let me try to talk you through it here. Randy, sure question. Is, yes. Who, who what, would, what would you consider a bad waveform that uh, I would be looking for uh, on this transistor? If it was bad, what would it show on the screen? Well, I'm guessing nothing would have come out. Okay, all right. I'm guessing it would have just be a flat line either at ground or at uh, power, VCC gotcha. level, okay. you know, one or the other. Um, so scroll down a bit till I like, see the chip, the chip there. Uh, uh, a little further, a little further, a little further. A little, yeah, yeah, beautiful. That's beautiful. Oh, you're doing such a good job. Further, further, further down, further down, further down. Yeah. Okay. Stop. Stop okay. there. All right. So um, our problem is with horizontal. It seems to be locked vertically. It doesn't it? Doesn't seem to be rolling vertically. It's just like the horizontal phase is off. P H A S E. Horizontal phase mm -hmm. um, and the way that kind of works is we have a couple of inputs scroll down just a little bit more please until like the chip is way up at the top of the screen there that's good that's great that's super stop 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 beautiful beautiful uh, let me just look a little bit so i don't misspeak let me just just look one sec here so i don't misspeak here 
Uh, have you changed, Paul? I, you said you've changed them all, but here's just an itty bitty one microfarad. Are you sure you got this one? Uh, yes, uh, there's actually three in a cluster right here. I've changed them all. Okay. Um, so there's this thing known as AFC. You see it up here, automatic frequency control. Scroll back up again, please. And what AFC does is it looks at the horizontal frequency. It takes some of the output, like it comes off the flyback or some sample of the output, and feeds it back in, in and compares where the sync is, the sync signal, the horizontal sync pulse, to what's coming out of the other end. So, so it keeps them synchronized. It, what it does is really is it develops a DC voltage that slightly shifts the oscillator, slightly shifts the phase so that it, um, so that everything is synchronized. And like I said, I think that you're like, you're off. So here's yeah. the, another one of the one microfarads you're talking about that you looked at. And now I'm really wondering if it's something bizarre and odd like this capacitor right here being bad this capacitor right here being Lisa. bad yes those guys are 452 451 and can you scroll up um so i can see that wire keep going up 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 i'm looking at the wire coming off of pin 16 by the way up 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 yeah it goes to the control board so i'm very suspicious there I'm really suspicious there. I mean, uh, can you double check all that interface and connection and that they're all good and all that? All that stuff? Uh, yep. On the, on the remote board, there's only one pot for horizontal, and that's horizontal centering. And I checked all the wires uh, going to the main chassis, and I tested the pot, and the pot is good. And it, and yeah, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be the pot, but it, but it's it's something to do with horizontal phase. When you say horizontal centering, that's horizontal phase. That's the yeah, it's, yeah. that means the same thing. Um, okay, can you make it a bit bigger than there, James? So I, I, up there where it says two circuit control circuit board. Yeah, scroll down. Perfect. Stop there, please. Stop there. Just stop there. don't know this is going to be too boring i'm going to have to spend some more uh let me just change cameras out of curiosity because i have had this issue before and actually down, randy James. yeah yeah randy you um you helped me with this one I'll actually i kind of figured it out two minutes before we had the conference call oh. all your 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 brightness levels have you you centered them out yeah i think paul knows what he's doing in that regard in terms of adjustments he's extremely uh, competent in that regard, I'm pretty sure. Paul, yes, you've you fiddled with all kinds of brightness and contrast. Oh, contrast, yeah. You have you tried cranking the contrast up and down? What happens? Um, it just gets brighter and dimmer. Uh, okay. Nothing changes. All right, all right. It really looks like it's reflecting off the side to me. It, it just really does. Uh, okay. But let me look at the thing uh, in the interim, and we'll see if we can do some. But I know we've eliminated sync, so that's good. At least it's a little. It's okay. a little progress. I just don't want to bore everybody. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of you. Yay. We don't want to lose any. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't want anybody to watch. It's not boring. It's actually neat because you, you get to see how you, you go through the thought process of it, right? And what you're looking to see. And how yeah. the, I learned about the AFV. That's, I hadn't actually played with that circuit or understood what that was before. No, so. AFC is an interesting but rarely failed circuit. That's why I'm so surprised. I personally, I've almost... I think once in my life I found maybe twice a little ceramic disc capacitors like the ones I just showed you on the schematic. I would uh, only by process of elimination. I would never have thought that in a million years. And, Quick and question before we call quits on this, Randy. Yeah. Huh? Uh, if I probe that chip uh, at the sink, should I get the same waveform as the transistor? Repeat that, please. I'm sorry. If I probe the chip, uh, like I did with the transistor, will I get the same same correct waveform on the chip? Oh, uh, well, where on the chip are you talking about? Well, you have point twenty three essentially, right? Where it comes yeah. in, but you're going to go through a resistor and you're going to go through that small capacitor, that uh, non polarized capacitor. So I don't know if that will change the form at all. Well, that's uh, that integrates it. So yes, it won't be a, a nice square thing. It'll just be a little pulse. It'll be a little tiny pulse. Gotcha. Because. Okay. Uh, 
because uh, the, the monitor isn't looking for a big wide pulse like that. It just is either looking at the, the, the rise time or the fall time. And so if it's just looking at that, let's give it a, a really narrow pulse. So it's, you know, right on kind of a thing. But you should see something, and which we, oh, I guess we didn't, did we? Didn't, we didn't look at the pin of the chip to see if it got to the input pin of the chip, did we? No, we didn't. That's what I was thinking. I was oh, yeah. That. We should have done that. That was stupid of me to not look at that. But, you know, I'm not sitting there with the probe in my hand. I would have just gone point, 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 you know. Right, right. Well, can you do it real? Can you do it? Uh, yep, yeah, I'm counting the chips. Uh, it's, the I, I don't have, I'm in behind the chassis. It's pin 23. Is that right, James? That You're looking at yeah, the Yeah, it was pin 23. Okay. Okay. That's the sync input to the chip. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's off the screen. It's off. Up. What? Let's see. Hold on a second. Should be zero DC. Should be no DC on it. Oh, see, there it is, there. right there. Can you sync it or spread it out or something? Because all we're yep. I'm seeing just the compressed waveform. Yeah. One second. Like increase the amplitude. There, there it is. is. Okay, so well, what, what am I looking at there? What's your time base? Am I looking at horizontal or am I looking at vertical? Uh, that's pin 23. That's the vertical. Well, it's composite, isn't it? So that's, make it, make it go slower. Make the time base slower, slower. Turn all the way counterclockwise. Oh, okay. Okay, so they're good. Yeah. So okay. those little down, those little downward, make it a little faster now, a little faster, just so we can see it. I'll, I'll just so I can explain something. There we go. Uh, is it synced? Anyway, those little downward spikes that you saw there, those are the horizontal sync serrations. And they look perfectly good. There's absolutely, okay. I, I see nothing wrong with that. All right. Well, this well, is a grand, least, it's a grand mystery. At least we eliminated one, uh, the sync, which is a good thing. I'll move on to something else. Okay. I'll cool. check yeah. out the a AFC. John, you've been very quiet. Are you saying goodbye or are you just saying hello? No, no, I just had a quick question here. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. And I had a question later too about my uh, my monitor. But but anyways, I just know, Paul, did you say it, uh, it, it changed after it warmed up or something? Yes, when it uh, is, if it's a cold start, I'll, I'll still have the tear at the top and it won't be uh, like 50% uh, dim, 50% uh, dark. It'll just have a narrow line of dark in it and the whole rest of the monitor will be uh, that faded dim. Dimness. Okay. So two things I had, and, and it might be just way out off on a tangent, but I noticed <clears throat> the little tear at the top sometimes is from uh, that ceramic capacitor on the neck board. Uh, Randy, I don't know. Like this, really? I'm just spit. Yeah. There's, there's upgrades that they do. I've, I've noticed they change it out with electrolytic actually, and they up the uh, microfarad a little bit. Uh, that's what I've noticed, but I could be way off. And second of all, just because you simply said, that because it warmed up, I noticed that when we were looking at that control board that may have something to do with the issue, there was a thermistor in there connected to that too as well. And that's what made me wonder about the warm up thing, if that thermistor's operating okay or- uh, it, For the, it, the thermistor for the degauss, the degausser? Well, it must be, but it was hooked up to the, it looked like it was, they had a node to the, to the control board we were looking at. Oh, I, oh okay. so. I think I think uh, John, I think you, you must be incorrect about <clears throat> it being a, a ceramic disc capacitor replaced with the microlytic on the neck board. That must be a filter for the video B plus, and it must be an electrolytic of at least ten microfarads. I'm guessing, and maybe even a hundred. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I, I but I can't imagine how that would affect the tear. However, I guess I missed when you said. It went over right over my head when you said warm or cold, the symptom is different. So that's a great candidate to attack with freeze mist, isn't it? You know, the component cooler uh, stuff. It's, that's a yep. great candidate for that. So armed with a hairdryer and the spray mist, you just heat stuff up till the problem goes away or, or occurs and freeze it. See if, if you can toggle it back and forth. Now that's a definite no brainer, easy thing and fun thing to do. Hey, whoever's dog that is, can you mute? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's mine. Uh, 
So the thermistor you're talking about, you mean you mean TH301? Uh yeah. Yeah, uh wow. Well, it just you know, I never balling. noticed that. I just never noticed that. Before. I just thought it's connected to the board that we're looking at and as soon as he I remember him saying uh, you know, temperature. Well, it's part of the voltage divider for the sub brightness pod as you can see. Um, and so I'm guessing it's so that when the monitor is cold, you set the brightness and as it heats up, it doesn't change brightness. I've never seen that though. That looks like a workaround. It looks like they built the thing and went, oh crap, as it heats up, it gets brighter. <laughs> Damn, we ought to put that thermistor in there or something. I don't know. I really know. I... Randy, I got a, a, since I'm looking at the schematic that's still up, there's a, there's a question I've had for years and years about these Sanyos that uh, I have no idea what the answer is. Maybe you have the answer. What is this service switch for that causes vertical collapse? <laughs> that's called the setup switch. And that's a throwback to the old, old, old television days. But it's, it's still there. And it's used to set up the, the red, green, and blue colors. The idea is that you would turn the brightness all the way down, like the screen pot all the way down, so you didn't burn the phosphor. When you hit that switch, all it does is cause vertical collapse so that you just have a horizontal line at the screen, on the screen. And then one at a time on the neck board, you would bring off the cutoffs until the line would just barely appear. So first you'd bring up the red cutoff until you just barely saw the red line. Then you'd bring up the green cutoff until you just barely saw the green and the red mixed together, which make yellow, of course. Then you'd bring up blue and it would look white and you'd, and that's how you did the color balance. That's how you oh, okay. did the white, okay. white balance of the thing. Because that way it didn't matter how the individual guns aged, you set it up for however the gun is right now. And Gotcha. And, and okay. So, but it's, yeah, it seems kind of lame to me. And how many television sets, uh, and, and monitors were brought in for repair because that's the symptom. You hey, know? that's easy money right there. Just flip the switch. Okay, yeah. 75 bucks. Yeah, I replaced, yeah, I replaced <laughs> a lot of stuff. Yeah, well, oh, could I, have the old, <laughs> could I have the old parts back? Oh, just a minute, digging the trash. Yeah, it's a bi-directional muffler <laughs> bearing was bad. The Tavistock wigwag was wiped out. There you go. So, Don't forget about the flywheel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. The, the flywheel is something. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, uh, heck, we got some kids coming over, uh, some relatives to show us their costumes and stuff. So if you don't mind, I think we'll call it quits for the today. I actually got to fly myself, so I appreciate that. All right. Oh, so a flight. Where are you going? Uh, well, my last name's Crows. I don't know wherever I got to go. Oh, I get it. <laughs> really funny. It's a dad uh, joke. <laughs> yeah. All right, you guys. Thanks very much. I appreciate having you here. Thanks for all your help. And I'll work on some stuff on your behalf and we'll see how it goes. I well, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you for putting these on, Randy. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Everybody, happy Halloween. Bye bye. Happy, happy Halloween. Halloween. Stay safe. Vote if you haven't. I hope you have. I'm not allowed. Oh, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> Don't you vote? You're going to jail. Yeah. Right. See everybody. See you. Bye bye. See you later, Randy.